Hello everyone, it's time for Recorded Asynchronous Lecture 13 for Bio 145 Microbiology. This lecture is scheduled for Thursday, October 12th of the year 2023. And today's topic is a continuation of physical controls and talking about chemical controls as well. Let's get to a little recap first. And it's time for a little recap on physical controls. So remember, physical controls are, are just ways to reduce or eliminate the microbes that are in something, whether it be the food, whether it be water, or on the surfaces, whatever. Um, and we're calling physical things, so we're not talking chemical stuff, we're talking like forms of energy. There's basically three mechanisms of, of ways of killing a microbe so it dies. Um, and you kind of we went through those, so make sure you know those. Now we're looking at one me mechanism of physical control, and that's heat. And heat has many forms, for instance, like a dry oven, an autoclave, and so forth. And we were also talking about, and we we're kind of finishing up with um, using filtration. And filtration is by excluding microbes. So you have microbes in a liquid or a gas, and you run them through a pores. And the size of the pores dictates can, basically can, what can get through, what can remain in the solution. So the microbes are excluded from the solution by the filter, by these pores, because they can't enter the pores. The pores are too small for the microbes. Right? And these are good for, um, what do you use them for? Okay, so here's your little picture. Like I said, they're good like for heat sensitive fluids, things that have like vitamins, growth, uh, pro growth factors, often proteins, which if you, uh, for instance, autoclave them or put them in a dry heat oven, you'd probably denature them. Also, it's good to save time. Some, you know, running a thing through a filter takes about a minute. Autoclave can take about between warming it up, actually expo heat exposure, cooling it down can take maybe up to an hour. But like I said, you know, everything comes with a cost and filters are very expensive. You know, even these dis disposable ones. So you just, you know, as a scientist, you got to think of the benefits of something, but you always got to think of the drawbacks. And unfortunately, money is a drawback you see in almost everything, folks. So that pretty much does the recap. Let's kind of get into some newer stuff, okay? Let's now go to the next topic for physical controls, and that's types of radiation. I'd like to call your attention here to the different types of radiation. So we have uh, radio waves, we have microwaves, and as we're getting to shorter wavelengths, we go into uh, X-rays and gamma rays. And in between the, the X-rays and uh, infrared or microwaves, there's this UV light, all right? And as you'll notice is once you get to UV and as the wavelengths get shorter, that's when you get to things that are bactericidal and really um, microcidal overall. So what you see then, looking at the wavelengths here, as you become shorter wavelengths, actually it gets more destructive. Okay, It gets more microcidal. It has greater potential to kill microbes. So that's when you start seeing UV, and you'll see even X-rays and gamma rays, or even more microcidal. So let's focus then on these different types of radiation, starting with UV light. And UV light should be a review of sorts, because we've already talked about it as a mutagen. As you probably remember, hopefully, the uh, most effective UV light is about w a wavelength of 265 nanometers. It is a sterilizing, it can kill, but it's not that strong, okay? So it can't go very deep. So it basically can sterilize things on the surface. But again, it doesn't penetrate. So for instance, UV light can sterilize things on the surface of something plastic, but it can't go through plastic. 
What it does though to kill microbes is UV light causes thymine dimers. If you remember that, those are between thymines that are together on the same strand. All right, it causes covalent bonds to form. All right, and because of that, when this happens in the DNA and it's not repaired, it's kind of a stop. It stops transcription. It stops DNA replication. So these are considered lethal mutations unless they're corrected. They're repaired correctly. So UV light is one type of radiation that is microcidal. Going on, let's go to the next set and, and going here, as you get to shorter wavelengths, we get X-rays and gamma rays. Now these are used on liquids and solids. It can be a sterilizer because it can go deep into things, right? It's, it can go deep into things. It's not just limited to going on the surface. These are shorter wavelengths than UV, as you can tell from the chart. And what it does is like, let's focus on gamma rays. The gamma rays force electrons out of their shells. Okay, for instance, in DNA. So they create ions, hence ionizing radiation. So you can imagine when an electron is lost, all right, that becomes an ion becomes an ion or a free radical even. Now when that happens, it has a nest in DNA. What happens is you've changed the bond now. That if the electron's not there, the bond breaks. And you can imagine that you could have a bond in DNA breaking here, a bond in DNA breaking here, and then this piece there that's bordered by the broken bonds, it falls out. So these nucleotides would fall out because you've broken the bond here, broken the bond here, and then it rejoins. Well, if you think about it, you've got a double-stranded break, two pot spots here, what's in between falls out, and then it, then it reforms. So what you result is a deletion in the DNA. Now, if this part of the DNA was in the coding sequence, if you make a deletion in the coding sequence, what's that known as? Uh, you should remember this, a frame shift mutation, right? If that deletion of one or two or four or five, it leads to a frame shift. And that can really change what amino acids are coded for by the protein, lead to an early stop later. And if that happens in enough proteins, those proteins become non-functional, that is going to kill the microbe. Too many frame shift mutations will kill the microbe. Hence, this is good as a microcidal agent. How is this used? Where is it used? Ionizing radiation. Well, if something is heat sensitive, all right, you can't throw it in the autoclave, obviously. And certain things you can't filter. So let's talk about like pharmaceuticals, for instance. Um, spices, a lot of foods, plastics, like insides of plastics. Okay, the UV can treat the outside, but how about if you want to go inside a plastic? Well, there you can use ionizing radiation to do that, such as gamma rays and x-rays. So it's good from killing things from insects all the way bacteria. For instance, in spices, spices are often dried out in the uh, open where there's a lot of things can get to them like birds and birds will poop on the spices, all right? And there's bugs get on the spices. Well, what do you do before the spices can be bottled up and sold? Often they're treated with gamma rays. Now, one benefit is that there's no benefit, in the, there's no change in the texture, the appearance, the flavor of the food. Uh, for the drug, it doesn't damage the drug per se. An example of using gamma rays is exposure of food, for instance, to cobalt-60. Cobalt-60 is a source of gamma rays and the FDA has approved it using for food. It's a safe way, safe way to treat food and uh, at least sanitize food and sterilize food. Now, cobalt-60 is a radioactive uh, element and a lot of people think, oh, you're passing 
food under radioactivity. Now the food becomes radioactive. Well, that, that's not true. That's like saying like you're exposed to x-rays and now because the x-rays, you know, you're radioactive. No, no, it doesn't work that way. The gamma rays, yeah, they're coming from a radioactive source, but they don't make what they're treated with radioactive. So the food that's treated with gamma rays doesn't become radioactive, even though there's a misperception of it, especially on the internet of that. Um, if you want to watch a video of a, a research professor who does work on uh, using gamma rays to uh, sterilize food uh, at Chapman College, which isn't that far from here, you can watch this uh, YouTube video link. Okay, it's just a few minutes long. You can just watch the first three minutes. Now, it's interesting that when a food has been treated with uh, gamma radiation, it has this seal on it. That's called the radura seal, the radura seal. Now, if you're a microbiologist and you understand this, you shouldn't be alarmed or worried. However, for some people that misunderstand things, they think, oh, this is scary and evil and bad. All right. So please don't be that way. Um, let's just talk about some examples here. Uh, so gamma radiation of food, like I said in this little advertisement, uh, you can sterilize food with gamma rays, right? You can kill a lot of types of microbes there, many pathogens. And the food, again, as this advertisement, does, does not make the food radioactive. There can be some slight chemical changes, but it usually tastes the same, looks the same, so forth. On the right here is actually an old-fashioned gamma radiation device. Uh, if you watch the video from Chapman College, the one I just talked about, YouTube, you can see a newer model. But uh, this is going to basic thing. This is in here. You've got your uh, cobalt 60 and out of here comes the gamma rays and you put the food, for instance, that you want to treat under it. So here I've got like my strawberries and uh, you basically set, you have to set up a few things and you put it under here and you expose it. And at that point you've killed a lot of microbes. In fact, you can, if you do it correctly, long enough, you can sterilize it. All right, you sterilize the micro, you can sterilize the food. Here's an example like, so once you've treated these strawberries, um, and here's so you have some non-treated strawberries, and you put them in a sterile compartment and just wait. So there's no way you can, if you put them in the sterile compartment, nothing from the air can go on them. And what you wait is, well, this was not treated, the pathogens on the surface of these micro, of these strawberries cause spoilage. But here, these have been sterilized. You put them in a sterile compartment and they're going to be good for a long, long, long time because you've basically killed all the microbes on them. So you can see it'll preserve food a long way, a long time. Also, it's used, for instance, for food that's uh, sent out with military people and like that, that they have to basically, they pack out their food, they go on some maneuver many, many days. They don't have refrigeration, they don't have a way of cooking it but the food is irradiated for them and it's used a lot in the military to preserve food. Again, there's the Radura seal. All right, let's go one last point, one last uh, physical control and that's microwaves. And the key thing to think about is microwaves. Again, these are, if you go back to the chart, these are have a longer wavelength, remember? is a longer wavelength if you go back meaning it's not as destructive, it's not as microcidal. So microwaves come out of your microwave, they hit the food, and the microwaves literally make food molecules vibrate. So here's a food molecule, you can imagine. Here's a food molecule, they've absorbed the microwave and they vibrate, they start vibrating and they start rubbing against each other. So you can imagine between these two people as they rub against each other, there'd be a lot of friction and that friction as they're rubbing against each other leads to heat. That's how microwaves work, kind of. It, it's very quick and popular, microwave food. It's a really quick way to warm it up. And, you know, the vibration, friction causes them to heat up. All right? It's mainly the water and the fat in the food. That is what basically absorbs the microwaves and vibrate. Now, however, this is really not a very good antimicrobial agent. If you have food, you heat it in the microwave for, you know, 30, 40 seconds. 
the food is sometimes hot. But number one, this number one, it's not a good antimicrobial agent because it's non-homogenous. The, the water and the fat are not homogeneously in the food. So the food will not heat homogeneously. There won't be a homogeneous heat throughout the food. Some parts get hotter than others, as you can taste if you ever bite into a piece of microwave food. So that's one reason it's not a very good um, antimicrobial agent. Secondly, there's a short what? Okay, you only cook 30 to 45 seconds, right? It's a very short exposure time. Very good exposure time. So that's another reason why microwaves are not a good means of physical control. Microwaves don't cause thymine dimers. They don't cause DNA deletions. They don't kind of thing special. They just generate heat, but that heat is not homogenous. It's only for a very short exposure time. So that's why if you have a food, it's been sitting in the fridge and you're kind of wondering, eh, should I eat it or not? And if you're really hungry and you want to eat it, it's best to use like a, a, a hot air oven for quite a long time versus a microwave okay, to kill the pathogens. Well, that does it for examples of physical controls. Let's now go to chemical controls of microbes. So in this case, we're thinking of things like liquids and gases, chemicals. Now, they're very important. Okay, let me just give you a couple examples. All right, there was a story a few years ago where there was a, a salon, a spa in Los Gatos, where they did a lot of pedicures. So when working on feet, usually people would come in and they'd put their feet in like these metal basins that's shown behind here. And so, and it, you, people were supposed to, the people who worked there were supposed to sanitize these basins after each customer used them. All right. Unfortunately, they didn't follow the procedure at this very one hush, posh, really fancy uh, pedicure spa. And so it wasn't properly sanitized. And so somebody brought in a pathogenic agent on their feet. They had a foot disease. It wasn't noticed. It would basically was transferred to the, uh, these uh, bowls, these dishes, whatever. And it became a fomite. It wasn't properly sanitized. So the next person and the next person and the next person that used these basins, these bowls, got that disease. All right, and it, and basically cause an outbreak of a, it's a mycobacterial based disease, and mycobacterial can lead to really bad uh, skin infections, purpley, ugly, painful, and they're really hard to get rid of, and they need to be treated with antibiotics for months at a time. So you have this outbreak of this foot disease that could have easily been prevented if the chemical controls were used properly to sanitize the basins and the bowls and stuff like that. Secondly. When we are here in person, you can go to the Bond Fitness Center and you'll see that there are chemical disinfectants out and there you're asked to disinfect the weight equipment after you sat on it. Well, why is that important? Because a lot of people do have skin diseases. They have pathogens on their skin. They transfer it to weight benches. Those become like fomites. And if you don't clean it, and, you know, clean it and kill it and sanitize it, then the pathogen can be basically go past from the fomite to the next person's skin and the next person can come down with that disease. So it's really important to use chemical controls when they're available. All right, please do that. You, if you have, number one, you don't want to give your disease to somebody else. And secondly, you don't want other people to give their skin disease to you. Now I want to make something clear here. These chemical control agents are non-selective in toxicity, meaning that at a high enough percentage or level, they will hurt the pathogen as well as your 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 cells as well so you just got to realize they're non-selective in toxicity if they're going to be used on a living tissue such as if they're an antiseptic you got to make sure you're using at the right percentage so they don't hurt your cells but they can still hurt any potential pathogen microbe so a little bit of terminology number one a chemical control agents can be microcidal or microstatic, okay? They can be an antiseptic, i.e. put on living tissue like skin, or a disinfectant, meaning they can put on non-living things. 
they're rarely sterilizers. I think we're going to talk about only one chemical control that is a reliable sterilizer. The others you can't trust. The classification, for instance, antiseptic versus disinfectant, I kind of alluded to this in the last slide, depends on the percentage in solution. For instance, chlorine at a low percent can be used as an antiseptic. But as in a high percent, like you find in your bottle of laundry ble bleach, you could never put that on your skin. So at a high percent, it's a disinfectant. But the same chemical, therefore, depending on the percent, can be an, an antiseptic or a disinfectant. Now let's look at some different chemical classes that are used for antimicrobial purposes. The first group are the phenolic compounds. And really, phenols were the first well understood and used antimicrobial chemical agents, if you go back in history. So, like I said, phenols and bisphenols are not sterilizers in general. Okay? Their mechanism of action is the following it's threefold. Number one, they cause death by denaturing proteins especially in the plasma membranes. So when you look at a phenol or a bisphenol, this is a bisphenol. So here's one phenol aromatic ring with an O coming off of it. Okay. Th this is a bisphenol because it's got two of these aromatic rings and with the oxygen coming off of it. Okay. Here and here. All right. That's a bisphenol. Just if, if this was by itself, it'd be just a phenol. I'll show you some pictures in a second. Um, they're nice and planar. They like to slide in to membranes. You can imagine membranes has a lot of places where things can slide in. Flat planar things can slide in. So number one, these are very good at denaturing proteins in membranes. Number two, they're also good at disrupting membranes. You can imagine them going between two phospholipids in a membrane. And number three, they don't kill, but they can basically remove things. All right, they're good for de-germing, meaning these phenolic compounds are slippery. All right, they're kind of feel almost if they're on your skin, they almost feel like soapy. And what they'll do is they'll reduce surface tension between the microbe and the surf and the surface they're on, like the microbe and the skin, for instance. All right, and they loosen the bacteria from the tissue, and so we refer to that as de-germing, de-germing. So it's not death, but it makes things slippery so they can be removed easily, okay? Some examples is triclosan, which is shown right here, all right? Triclosan, which is shown right here. This is a uh, bisphenol. It's got two aromatic rings. And it very bro it's a very broad spectrum, like antimicrobial. I'll explain what broad spectrum later is. And it used to be put in like everything. Anytime you saw antibacterial thing, like antibacterial soap, toothpaste, sponges, um, antibacterial kit, you know, kid kitty tables, you know, uh, antibacterial plastics, and even antibacterial underwear. Pretty much, you could best bet it had triclosan in it, and it was an antimicrobial agent. And here are the mechanisms. All right, but as it turns out, they did later studies and said, you know, it's really not that effective. And it really wasn't worth it. So they ended up taking it out. So now you don't see triclosan as much because they realize much later, hey, it's really not that effective. Now you think, shouldn't they have done these tests before they put it into all these things? Well, I can't explain that. Uh, here's just your basic picture of a phenol. Okay, it's an aromatic ring with an OH on it. And these are some different types of phenols that you find um, in commercial items. Uh, one thing you might use is... Uh, if you have a sore throat, you can buy sucrets. There's these lozenges. And they have antimicrobial, plus they uh, kind of uh, deaden the pain a little bit. Okay, it doesn't hurt as much. So that's sucrets. And they have, that's a, basically their active ingredient is a type of phenol. The second group are the halogens. And halogens are elements, they have seven electrons in the outer shell, and they need one more electron to complete the shell. Um, so they really want to get that eighth one. And in order to do that, they'll steal. They will oxidize, meaning they'll steal an electron from a donor. All right. An example are chlorine, iodine. Those are halogen. 
they are oxidizers. Now, they're not sterilizers in general, okay? But they can be used as antiseptics and disinfectants. The first example is chlorine, which you'd find in the chlorine bleach here. What are the mechanisms of action? And they're not, they're kind of never been absolutely proven. They're kind of assumed, but we'll go with it. Number one, they change membrane structure. They cause le leakage and lysis. And they also known for denaturing enzymes. And you can imagine if they're stealing electrons from uh, compounds in membranes or they're stealing electrons from proteins, they're going to cause these results. The problem with uh, something like chlorine is it's very reactive. So reactive that it's not stable. So if you put it in water, for instance, or some other environment, yeah, it will attack microbes. It'll attack the membranes of microbes, the proteins of microbes, the enzymes of microbes. All right. But it's so reactive, it breaks down very quickly. It's not around long enough to do as much killing as you want it to. All right. It breaks down too fast. So the, the problem is it's again, there's a problem of a short exposure time. All right, when you're using straight chlorine. So to get around that, chlorine, for instance, has been modified to improve its exposure time. So it's used to sanitize water. Well, how did you get around the stability problem? Well, what was created were these chloramines. So here's an example of a chloramine. Basically, you've added an amine group NH3 to your chlorine, or sorry, NH2 to the chlorine, and that makes a chloramine. And what you're basically doing is the uh, NH2 kind of now slowly releases the chlorine. So it's less reactive, but it will have a longer time, a longer exposure time. It'll last longer. It'll kill more things before it's broken down. So it's a much more effective antimicrobial agent. So if you add chlorine to water, yeah, it might kill 20, per, 20 things per second, but it only lasts a few seconds. Versus if you add chloramine, it might kill only 10 things per second, but it'll last several minutes. So, and it is pretty uh, common. It's actually even used in Stockton water supplies to sanitize the water. Like I said, it's not a sterilizing agent, but it's a sanitizing agent. And chloramines have a much longer exposure time than the original chlorine. Another type of halogen is iodine, right? Iodine is often found in iodophores. So an iodophore, and that's like betadine, okay? And you might, if you've ever had a bad cut or you've gone in for some type of surgery, they'll often treat your skin with this orangey brown solution called betadine. Betadine is an iodophore. It has iodine and it has in organic complexes. So iodine, think of iodine like here, with an organic complex, something with carbons, carbons, all right? And what these, why is it like that is because again, iodine by itself is too reactive. But if you complex it with something organic, that organic thing, again, releases the halogen, in this case, iodine, slowly so it makes the iodine have a longer exposure time all right now what is that organic thing well that organic component sometimes are detergents and detergents are used because not only do they increase the exposure time but detergent by itself will kind of act like a de-germing agent it'll loosen the organisms from the surface so it de-germs so in an iodophore like betadine, which is common antiseptic used on the skin, not only do you have the mechanisms of action that the, it's oxidizing, attacks membranes, disrupts membranes, attacks proteins, denatures proteins, but also it helps loosen up, de-germ the microbes so they can be easily removed from the surface of the skin. So you get a lot of bang for the buck. Let's now go to heavy metals. It's the next group. Heavy metals are like mercury, copper, silver, selenium, zinc. All right. And 
For instance, you wondered, well, why do you have heavy metals like gold and silver in your teeth? Well, they're hard, yes, but they have an antimicrobial property. What is that antimicrobial property? Well, the heavy metals, they react with thiol groups, so that's some thiol groups or SH groups. And when these are in proteins, they cause the proteins to denature. All right. So if there's if a microbe has a lot of proteins that are rich in SH groups. So what amino acid has SH? Remember, Cyst in the side chain, yeah, cysteines. All right. It attacks the cysteines. So therefore, those proteins are inactivated or they're denatured. So that microbe now has a lot of proteins who are deactivated, denatured. All right, by the heavy metal, and then they die. All right. Now again, these are not sterilizers generally. Um, another example is uh, Salsum Blue. Uh, it's an anti-dandruff shampoo. A little cocktail here. It's an anti-dandruff shampoo, and a lot of people think, well, dandruff is caused by having too dry of a scalp. Well, it can also be caused by certain pathogenic microbes, actually molds that get in the scalp. So to kill the molds, you give them selsum blue and selsum blue is rich in selenium, which is a heavy metal. And if you, you understand that, that, sel, that selenium is going to attack the cysteines and the proteins of the pathogen, the molds, kill them and hopefully it'll clear up your dandruff. So that's why selsum blue is used and used for dandruff. All right, because it's going to kill what can cause the, the, the agent. It can cause kill the mold. Now, that's not all. Um, so we talked about silver and fillings. Uh, we'll talk about that. But also, you can find silver even in what? To stop odors. Well, the answer is clothing. So let me read this. This is an actual article from uh, 2005. It came from the Stockton Record. And I kept it. And I wondered, is anything ever going to come of this? And it did. So the, the article starts with, imagine having a shirt that you can wear several days in a row for serious hiking during a camping trip. And you never have to wash it. And you don't even, won't even drive away your companions or every living, breathing being for 20 feet. You wear this shirt days on end after sweating into it profusely. And it does not smell. How can this be? Well... It goes on to say, a new collection of sporting clothes in gears by Brooks, okay, called HVAC uh, clothing claims to stymie the stink by eliminating most of the bacteria. So the bacteria that are in the clothes that you sweat in, all right, they actually create the odors you think of as body odor, all right? So it goes on to say, when the R&D crew at Brooks started developing the product a few, three years ago, this would be 2002, they were trying to create f clothes that had enhanced thermoregulation, helped you cool off quicker. Odor control was not their objection, objective. However, they ended up killing two birds with one stone. All right, the researchers incorporated silver fibers, which is a conductor for cooling, into the fabric such as polyester and nylon. The fibers moved heat away from the hot spots, such as the arms, to other parts of the garment, hence giving you cooling. It turned out that the silver integrated fabric also had an antimicrobial property. It goes on to say test subjects worked out as they normally would every day in their HVAC shirts for a week to 10 days. The shirts were not washed between workouts. They were stink free the entire time. And it goes on to say they expect to market these clothing soon. This is from 2005. And now you can actually find these clothes on the market. Now, they're kind of pricey, but yeah, you can wear them several days in a row and they pretty much don't smell. But of course, you have to pay a price. Um, where else would you find it? So like I said, here's some uh, the sporting clothes that have the silver in them. Um, but where else do you find heavy metals? So you think, well, you copper and door handles. Well, why is that good? Okay, well, copper's pretty, but also copper's a heavy metal. And remember, it can often be a fomite. So the copper helps kill the microbes. So on these frequently touched surfaces, like it says here, so it's not as bad as a fomite. Um, you ever think about it? Food utensils also have heavy metals in them. Again, antimicrobial. Uh, the lining of this incubator. 
some uh, mouthwashes. Okay, again, microbes create odors in the mouth. You can kill them with the heavy metals that are in some mouthwashes. Now, a little is good, but uh, too much is bad. So this person is suffering from agera. Look at their skin tone. It's kind of silvery, isn't it? Well, basically, this person consumed too much silver. It accumulated in the body, and it's irreversible. And now they have this hue to their body because of their silver consumption. It was interesting, a little cocktail. There was a person who ran for a lieutenant governor in Montana several years ago. And his platform was basically getting people to consume more and more silver because he was like, silver has all these great properties. And if you looked at the person, a picture of him, his, this, the, his skin tone was not this bad, but it was kind of bluish gray like silver. It's pretty interesting, you know. Let's go on to another type of heavy metal as an application is copper. Now, copper, again, is bactericidal and, and brass, which is made with copper, is often used in buckets in India to collect water. And so the people basically would have this practice where they'd collect water from a, a river. And often the river water was fecally contaminated because of poor sanitation. But they would take the water, put it in their fecal contaminated water, and they, they wouldn't touch it for two days. And then after that, they would drink the water and they wouldn't get sick. And at first, uh, scientists thought, oh, this is just, this is nuts. What's, what's going on here? That can't be. So I did the study with the, with the buckets and they found out, oh yeah, that the copper, antimicrobial, attacking cysteines, actually killed a lot of the bacteria in the fecally contaminated water and made the water safe. So there was something to storing the water for 48 hours in copper buckets. Now, copper sulfate is another thing. It's found, for instance, in your swimming pool. Your swimming pool has that bluish hue because of copper sulfate. It's to keep down the growth of bacteria and other microbes in the water. And also around here, where it's a big grape growing region, uh, copper sulfate is used as a fungicide, all right, to fight off molds that could really harm the grapes and hurt production and even kill the grapes. Now, how that was discovered, that copper sulfate was a, a very effective fungicide for grapes is quite a story. And I promise to share that when we have the synchronous version of this, okay? It's a pretty good skit. I, I think it's worth listening to or coming to, okay? And you'll find out about it if you come. Hopefully you come. And by the way, this is a uh, grape that's suffering from uh, downy mildew. You can see this yellowish patch, all right? This is what it's about. Our next group of chemical control agents are alcohols. And as you might have remembered from a few lectures ago, ago, that the majority of alcohols that are produced in the world are not for consumption in alcoholic beverages. They have commercial and, and other uses, um, like a lubricant, a, a solvent, and for instance, an antiseptic or a disinfectant. So how do alcohols use, are used to kill microbes, for instance, as antiseptics and disinfectants? Well. They work by two mechanisms, um, denaturing proteins, disrupting membrane lipids. So there's two ways to kill, right? Let me focus though on how the denaturing of protein is done. So in this case, imagine you have a protein and it's just one protein. It's got an N terminus and a C terminus and proteins remember to have function. They must fold. All right. They're folded up. And so what keeps them folded? Well, often it's hydrogen bonds, okay? Hydrogen bonds between the side chain of one amino acid and the side chain of another amino acid within the same protein. What alcohols do is they compete with those amino acid side chains for hydrogen bonds. So originally when there's no alcohol around, there's an aspartic acid, it hydrogen bonds, with a tyrosine, okay, these two amino acids are in the same protein and allows for hydrogen bonding. When alcohol is added, alcohol causes denaturation. It causes the hydrogen bond that was in that protein to break. Why? Because alcohol is like an evil tempter. It says, hey, aspartic acid, don't make a hydrogen bond with that tyrosine. 
make it to me, I am much more attractive. So it comes along and says, okay, I'm not going to make it with the tires. I'm going to make it with you, alcohol. In the same case, another alcohol molecule comes to the tyrosine and says, psst, psst, hey, don't make a hydrogen bond with the aspartic acid. Make it with me. I'm much more attractive. So it ends up making, making it with this alcohol. So the hydrogen bond that used to be between the aspartic acid and the tyrosine is broken because of the act of, uh, of uh, the alcohol. The, it breaks and therefore the protein denatures. Now, again, these are not generally sterilizers, all right? For instance, they're good against vegetative cells, but they're not against spores. So that's why I say in lab, um, you can take a spreader, you can soak it in alcohol, and that'll kill a lot of vegetative cells, but it won't kill the spores. Remember, you have to use a flame to actually burn off and kill the spores. That's why you flame things. Now, how about alcohols for antiseptics, all right? You can go into a drugstore and find 70% and 100% ethanol or 70 or 100% isopropanol for antiseptics. Which one should you buy? Well, most of us would probably look at it and say, well, you buy the 100%, more alcohol, the better. Well, actually, no. It's actually the 70% is the better antiseptic. Okay. Why? Well, the other 30% and the 70% is water. Okay, and the water prevents what of alcohol, which leads to a longer what? So this is a theme we've heard a lot today. Well, water prevents the evaporation of the alcohol, and so with the with the, the alcohol doesn't evaporate, it sticks around longer, so it gives you a longer exposure time. So that's why you should use seventy percent isopropanol, not one hundred percent if you want to have an effective antiseptic on your skin. Right. Uh, water also allows for better penetration of the microbe cells. All right, when the water's there, the alcohol can get into, into the, into the micro and actually denature proteins inside. So that's another reason for having the, the, the water there. Now you might say, well, hold it. I mean, that's fine and all, but man, why is it so painful? Is it because you're actually denaturing the proteins in your cells. Is that why it's painful? And the answer is no. Actually, alcohols like ethanol, for instance, they bind what's called the vanilloid receptors in your skin. And these vanilloid receptors are usually turned on by heat. And so you get your hand too close to a flame. It stimulates the vanilloid receptor. It sends a signal to the brain, which says, oh, burning. You're thinking you're burning. Get away from that. But in the same way, alcohol, not, which isn't heat, but alcohol can trigger, activate that vanilloid receptor, send the signal to the brain, and you perceive that as burning. So that's why alcohol seems to burn, but if there is no heat, but it does seem to burn when it's put on your skin. Okay? So that kind of sometimes limits its use because people don't like that burning sensation. All right? However, alcohol is really, really useful. Like I said, it's often combined with other antimicrobial agents. So instead of using water, they'll dissolve the agent in alcohol if it dissolves in there. So that's called a tincture. A tincture is we have another microbial agent in an alcohol. For instance, you could have a tincture of iodine. We talked about iodine as a halogen, but, but don't put it in water, put it in alcohol tincture of mercury, heavy metal, tincture of uh, silver, which uses an antiseptic also, you get the idea. Well, why do you do that? Because that way you get a two-fisted attack. All right, you get the best of both worlds. All right, so you think of a tincture of silver. All right, well, from the alcohol, you're going to damage membranes and you're going to denature proteins in general by that breaking the hydrogen bonds. All right. And then the silver will allow you to inactivate the cysteines, which will help you further to inactivate and denature the proteins. So now you got a double fisted thing. You've got the effects of the alcohol in this fist. You got the effects of the silver in this fist. All right. So that's why tinctures are pretty common as antiseptics and disinfectants too. Our next group is the cationic detergents. All right. 
And why don't we take a break at this point and we will start part two at cationic detergents.